Welcome to this episode of Views. This is John Lasseter. And today we're going to talk about another battleground period in fine art and how that's affected the way we see and operate today. And I get so much out of these periods. This is one that I've talked about before with my member group. Um, this is the, the 1850s. And uh, around 1850, there was just a, a cauldron of ideas and just an overwhelming amount of art students all gathered in the area of Paris, France. And so in Western art history, the, the 1850s, I would say, was, a, was just a very interesting time. And it's when many of, uh, you know, people that really rose to the top through, through the 1800s, through the late 1800s, um, I, uh, top is the wrong way of putting it. They, they rose to, I guess, to prominence. Um, they, they were affected by the environment, the, the soil, let's say, of the, of the mid-century. And so the mid-century is a really interesting time to study. Um, I've brought this book up before, but it's an excellent book written by a uh, history professor, I believe, at um, the University of Arkansas. And it was published by Yale Press, as you can see. But Daniel, Daniel Sutherland wrote this excellent book on, on the life of Whistler. And there's a section about Whistler's um, sort of first dive into bohemian artistry in Paris uh, from 1854 uh, to 1858. And uh, in just reading about that history, I got so much. So what I want to do is show you some images. And we're going to talk about the different like prominent painters of that time and how that now affects the way we uh, think and paint. and. I might even critique some of those paintings for you, just to explain some differences. Here is a look at Paris in 1850, just a, a tourist postcard painting, but um, this is really similar to the way it looks right now, if you've been there, except that this area right here has all been knocked down um, and is just a garden, the garden Tuileries. It's just this wall, has pretty much come down right here. And it opens up the area. This is where the pyramid is right here now. So just giving you a little bearing if you've been there and you're kind of wondering what you're looking at. And then of course, this is the the river and then all the different bridges going across the river. Um, and then this, uh, actually, I think this, this bridge right here is the one with the locks on it, or it might be this one, I forget. <laughs> And then uh, this is the Notre Dame back here. So that is the Ile, Ile, Ile de France, I think it's called, the, the island of France. And you might remember a, a demo I did of a little tower, but there's a little tower right here and I'm not sure what it's part of exactly, but um, it was glowing in the sunlight and I painted it one time. Right over here is the, an academy, the, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not a real expert, but I recall that building was some sort of academy. And then there was the, uh, the Beaux Arts Academy is somewhere back in here. This is the Italian district. And a lot of the artists lived in the Italian district um, because it was cheaper. Yeah, I'm trying to think what else. There's all kinds of great cafes over here and uh, many galleries now. So this is just an interesting look at all of that. Just putting us there in that time period. So let's go to the next slide. So let me read something to you. Um, when Whistler, who's uh, in this book described as arriving in, in Paris in 1854, um, there were some very strong influences going on in Paris, the Paris art scene. Um, the classicists uh, were led by by Ang or Ingres, and this is one of his paintings. And you can see probably classical or classicism is a good way of describing the way he paints here. Okay, um, their influences and who they who they were looking at for inspiration were were Raphael, so they felt like they were in the vein of Raphael and uh, David who was a French painter 
might have even been alive at this time, but he was kind of a late 1700s, early 1800s painter. Um, so that, that's who they followed. But um, but Ang was a teacher at the Beau Arts, I believe. And so that's where kind of the center of his way of teaching things was. Um, the other major, major influence at the time was uh, Delacroix. And Delacroix uh, taught, uh, he was a, a romanticist, would be a good way of putting him. So classicist versus romanticist. Um, and the Romanticists, they stressed color at the expense of drawing and finish. So they, they weren't so concerned about the finish quality, the, the polished quality that you saw uh, with Ang's figure, um, where the skin is just perfectly polished out. Uh, instead, you see a rougher, um, more expressive way of brushing around the paint. And they were um, very interested in, in the legacies of Titian and Rubens. Uh, Rubens probably sparks some connection. When you, when you think about Rubens, he painted very fluidly, I would say. And so that's what you see with, with Delacroix's work. And Delacroix was, uh, this is also interesting to note, Delacroix was younger than uh, than. Ang by about 18 years. And so he was sort of a, the upstart, right? <laughs> There's always someone younger coming along and showing a different way of, of just to just kind of stir up the pot, let's say. Um, there was also a third school of thought at that time. It wasn't as prominent, but it was coming onto the scene. And it was the work of um, Corot. And this is Corbet. So Corbet really took the mantle of Corot and introduced realism, realism, which was to also to kind of probably marry the, the, the classical and romantic. They, they were, they were very, uh, they were leaning more towards Delacroix, but they, they wanted to take that, that kind of romantic way of seeing things and apply it to everyday life. So as you know, then this, this became kind of the standard for uh, going into impressionism because impressionism impressionism was about light and color, not so much about the subject, and and, and even applied then to everyday subjects like uh, just po poverty stricken people or just uh, kind of seedy parts of town and that kind of thing. So those are the three major influences that Whistler came upon, and so he had a. Um, he had a choice to make as a student. You know, he's young in his 20s. And so he's thinking he likes uh, parts of all, you know, he, he liked things about all three um, schools of thought. And he, you know, he was probably heavily influenced by the younger uh, people that were pushing these new ways of painting or just kind of, they weren't new, but they were sort of reawakened ways of painting. And so he was, he was definitely leaning towards those, I would say. And, but he wanted to take on a teacher that, that didn't really take sides. And so who he ended up la landing with was uh, uh, Charles Glyer, uh, which is spelled G-L-E-Y-R-E, -E, Charles Glyer. And whoops, this is the wrong <laughs> slide for that. Um, Charles Glyer is, uh, at the time, was uh, he's a Swiss-born painter that lived in Paris, France, and um, he was doing these large-scale paintings, very much like like you see with Delacroix or or David. David. Um, and the he was something about him though was was very attractive to students. And let's read about him. Um, he scoffed at, at awards and titles. He wasn't a member of the the Beaux Arts. He had um, nurtured hundreds of students uh, when he opened his training studio uh, in 1843. And he was known for two things. Most notably, he charged no tuition. Wow. And uh, never forgetting his own poverty-stricken student days, he asked only that pupils pay a nominal fee for using his studio. Um, secondly, he encouraged independent original thinking. That's cool. 
his own prejudices tended towards classicism, but he promoted no school or tradition in painting. Similarly, Glier uh, preferred informal teaching methods. He corrected errors and misjudgments discreetly, more through suggestion than direction. So think about that, that you, you might see a similarity maybe to, to my way of thinking and teaching it is more like that. Like I don't have a stringent a linear way of teaching. And so um, my the members of, of the views community will relate with how I'm I'm a little more gentle in pushing ideas and definitely more promoting of I, I really want people to explore and, and find their own way. And it's not to protect any sort of way of painting. I I I don't have any just solid ground that I stand on. And uh, it's really just meant to be uh, like soil, good soil, you know, and and so I introduce ideas and we we share ideas and and have a uh, good discussion. And I really definitely promote trying to paint from historical work. I I promote exercise and um, I I still don't even do any just major large scale work because to me it's the more there's more fun in the ideas. And the the trying of things, um, the practicing of of areas that I'm trying to grow in, and so that that's really what I want to foster in this group. So anyway, I really relate with Glare, and let me let me explain one more thing that Whistler really got from Glare. This is this is interesting because it it goes back to some of the other lessons that I've been teaching. Um, Whistler spent enough time with Glare to absorb other lessons. Most importantly, he learned the value of drawing from memory. Whoa, we have been doing that, practicing that. Glyer encouraged students to sketch the models they had seen by day when away from the studio. So sketching from the model, but then, you know, in their own time, uh, he wanted, he encouraged them to continue to sketch from their memory of those models. Um, this practice, he said, encouraged spontaneity and added energy to their work. So spontaneity and energy. Um, so that, that I thought that was really cool too. Is that what you see now is uh, Glier really was a predecessor to teachers like Henry, who who also encouraged that in the early 1900s. So 50 years later, Henry was promoting that same ideal, you know, sketch from memory, draw from memory, um, practice memory. There's also a generosity. Uh, a, a ra relaxed approach in Henry's teaching as well. So I'm just trying to carry on that tradition. I think that's a really important tradition. Um, I only serve myself by having a stringent, uh, linear way of teaching, um, but I want to serve you instead. And so I really think this is the best way to serve, serve the people in, in the views community. And this is a, a painting by Henry Fanton Latour. And here he is right here. Uh, Latour was, an, uh, was one of the students of, um, of Glyer also. And Latour, they, what, um, what is this painting about? You might've seen this painting before, but they are all honoring the great Delacroix. So Delacroix really had, a, had an important uh, role in fostering this new romanticism, which which was uh, very freeing for, for the young uh, painters of that time. Some other notable painters in this, because there's also some writers in here too, but this, this is Whistler here, and this here is Manet. So Manet, Fanton Latour, and Whistler. And, but uh, Latour and Whistler were both students of Glyer. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, we could talk about some of the what we're seeing in these paintings. Let's let's look at because all all of these painters are excellent, worthy of study. Um, you might find yourself leaning towards one or the other. I think if you're a more of a beginner student, maybe we would lean. You know, in modern painters, would lean more towards um, the, the Delacroix way of of painting because it's it's freer. Um, it doesn't require as much precision. But there's a lot of beauty to the work of, of Eng that is, is um, worth noting because I did many loose paintings of, of faces and figures 
also landscapes. But just the loose painting was was really interesting. But it's it's hard to get things in a loose painting like the offset of eyes, or you know, like one one mouth having a larger turn than the other. Um, the character of hair, you know, <laughs> it's it's just difficult to do that when you're just loading that brush and just painting around. You can't exactly show the same character. And at first, I didn't even as a painter, I didn't even notice character that well. Like I, I was more interested in large things, big spots of color, you know, big spot for the face. <laughs> so I was doing that for a lot of years because it, it, it's already a, a difficult leap to get those things right, get those values and get those colors right. But then once you're able to get those a little quicker, you start to notice the characteristics or the small things. And at least in my life, that's the way it worked. And um, I'm just interested now in, in maybe exploring those things a little more now that I've learned how to do, you know, kind of longer form paintings. Um, but just a, a beautiful, I mean, look, look, uh, here's a good use of color over here. This is kind of the brightest color in the whole painting is, is right down in here. And uh, it, it's a nice offset from the face. The face will always draw your eye, but if you don't have other areas of interest, the eye will just get stopped. It'll stop right in the face, right? So um, the imbalance of this beautiful tablecloth in the bottom right um, to the more centered figure up here is, is an excellent offset uh, that kind of has an asymmetry that's just really beautiful in this portrait. And um, the Delacroix <clears throat> painting is, is more of a study probably. So, I mean, it's hard, it's difficult to criticize that at all, but um, let's just uh, admire it for the things that are admirable. I mean, look at the, the excellent, just soft edge all, all along here, <laughs> all along the whole left side, basically. In comparison with the the sharp edge, let's say of of the nose where it hits shadow, um, <clears throat> or just the sharper edge of of here, you know, there's there's definitely more contrast going on here, and so um, <clears throat> the differences in contrast cause different edges. So that's a reason for softer edges sometimes is just the contrast isn't as strong. That's that's one approach to painting. It's not a, a rule. But it's it's a it's a, an excuse to have a variety of edges, <clears throat> and just instead of um, you know I was talking about the character of of Eng's uh, facial features. I mean, you can see in this one that there's the eyes are offset, but that's not a that's not like an emphasized feature. It's more like the 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 landscape of the face was interesting. Look at the way the the brush just sort of seems to do this. You know, you can kind of feel that he doesn't stop with one brush stroke. He's he's brushing and brushing and brushing, following a kind of a snaking path throughout the face. That's a that's a really lovely way of seeing things, right? It's more rounded edges. You just feel the roundness of things and the kind of the topography of the the face and the topography of the hairline. You know, there's just this lovely, um, just it's luscious maybe as a way of putting it. And that was a very French ideal. Um, it wasn't new in Delacroix's time. Okay, and then let's look at uh, Courbet's painting. This obviously is not a portrait of anybody famous. And it's, it's as a matter of fact, a, a battle scene in a, in a wounded man. It's called the wounded man. He has obviously a wound in his chest and he's dying or something like that. And uh, so it's more realism. It's a, it's kind of, it has a, a coarseness or a, uh, a profaneness to it. You know, like it's not something to celebrate a dying man. I mean, unless, unless you're going to show why he's dying or something, you know, <laughs> like, like he's just slayed a dragon and saved a woman or something like that. But that, um, so that, that, that's the realism. And also you don't see just the painterliness or the, there's no love of, of Rubens or something like that in here with snaking paint lines or anything like that. It's just kind of coarse, um, free, 
and really is kind of the the beginnings of a more modern way of of thinking and seeing you know just there's definitely a great variety in this one more variety than in Delacroix's piece I just showed the there's very crisp edges in here um and and a an approach to the paint here as well like it's it seems to be loaded on maybe with a palette knife perhaps um there's also a buildup of the paint here that reminds me of Rembrandt uh, where he's kind of got soft, 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 and then all of a sudden just really thicker paint uh, that seems to have even been uh, glazed or just built up would be a good way of putting it a little bit in here as well. It's dark too. It's pretty, pretty dark, but then all of a sudden you got this just very uh, strongly lit area. None of that's new, none of it's new, but it's, I mean, as you look at these other two, there's a lot more, a lot more thought through design in this one, uh, much more, uh, much more consistent style maybe in the Delacroix piece. And then you come to, to this one and there's just a variety of influences, let's say he's, a, he's kind of a mixed bag artist here. So. So those are those were the three major forces in in Paris, and so we we can learn something from that. What do we what do we do with with this? You know, how do you how do you stand out against such? Um, I mean, these were powerful forces in the time of 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 Whistler. They must have felt just unworthy and uh, unable to ever join into that stream fully. You know. I mean, they were thinking of Delacroix as, as a god here, <laughs> essentially. So how do you how do you rise up? How do you become one of those? You don't you don't know that you ever reach that 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 pinnacle, right? I think you just you just admire you you admire in a way that's not jealous. You admire in a way that is thankful that that these people came along in in time and showed you the way, and you take it and you add yourself to it somehow. There, there was a finding of yourself that, that is so important. So you look at these people, you admire them, you look at the work even of Whistler and Manet, and you say, wow, you know, I'm so grateful to be part of, of that stream of time, and that stream of understanding. And um, now it's time for me to, to take that admiration and um, look at life in my own way. Um, your own way will just come out of you. You know, if you take the time to admire and maybe even copy some of these people, your own way will come out. So anyway, thank you for uh, paying attention through this very long lesson <laughs> about Paris, France in the 1850s. And uh, what an exciting time. I wanna be romantic. I wanna go back and be part of this, but I can't. And uh, I'm just grateful that I know about it. I'm grateful that we can go and, and see paintings by these people. Um, actually, the Orsay has paintings by a lot more of them, and it's over here somewhere. So uh, make it to Paris, France, if you've never been there, and, and go kind of dive into to this. You know, many of those artists I talked about would would come across the bridge from wherever they were studying right into this building and admire the works of of painters and artists through uh, centuries and millennia of time. And uh, what a great, what a great thing these institutions, these museums are. Uh, I could spend about 10 weeks in the Louvre just every day admiring, writing down notes, thinking about it. Might be a good idea. Let's go do that. All right, guys. Thank you. <laughs>